And this is Ken Kratzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio. We're based in White Plains, New York at Squadron 135, post 135 of the American Legion. We have 350,000 members across the country. And one of the things that we do enjoy so much is covering Army football and covering many of the events of the United States Military Academy. And today we have a chance to catch up with the Deputy Director of Athletics, a 31-year veteran of the United States Army, a, a Colonel, and that is Dan McCarthy. Dan, how are you today? I'm doing great, Ken. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. It's been, I've been looking forward to catching up with you. Uh, maybe if you would just tell us about what it's been like for you the last two months since uh, uh, spring break, the uh, cadets were sent home to study online. And I know the uh, we talked with Jeff Munkin uh, about the work being done to uh, to communicate with the with the cadets and the athletes on a daily basis and and work with them as best you can. What's the last two months been like for you? Yeah, so it's obviously it's been very very different than uh, than the typical spring here at West Point. Um, you know, I think anybody any of us that get into this business and working with athletics, um, you know, we do so because we're excited about being able to work with the young men and women who are on our athletic teams and. And they're really the lifeblood of an athletic department. And so to not be able to have our student athletes on campus has been definitely uh, a different kind of, it sort of drives you day to day. And then of course, not having competition, right? So getting the opportunity to see our, our you know, the fruits of our labor, if you will, like what we put into our teams from a, an administrative and from a coaching perspective, to be able to watch our young men and women compete athletically and to compete for championships. Um, so it's definitely been very different. You know, the, the thing that's a little bit unique here at West Point, obviously, you know, we're in athletics. And so people who follow athletics knows that, know that, you know, things have shut down across the country. Um, we're, we're at a university. And so people who, 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 you know, have sons or daughters maybe going to school right now, and they've had the, their sons or daughters home from schools because they've shut down. And I think the third component here that's unique is that, um, you know, we're a military uh, post, we're a military organization, and so we've got to deal with all of the, the sort of the military aspects of, of, of what we do here at West Point to include, you know, following guidance from the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, and so those three things kind of come together um, and make it a unique environment um, for us to try to navigate through while we're dealing with the, this COVID crisis. And then, lastly, you know, West Point is, a, is, is like a gated community, right? It's a city in and of itself, and so um, our leadership, our university president, our superintendent um, has to deal with also being kind of the mayor of a city and making decisions, um, you know, public health decisions and things like that. So it's really created a very uh, challenging environment for us. I think we're well suited to handle it given um, the, the, the types of folks that we have here who've dealt with complex situations or crises in other parts of the world, you know, through their military training. Um, and so we've taken a military approach to kind of dealing with, with COVID. And I think it's helped us to stay organized, to help us be thoughtful um, and keep our, our, our students, our cadets, um, at the forefront of the decisions that we're making, their health and safety, what's best for them at the forefront of what we're doing on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely not uh, the typical spring. I, I wish we had been watching baseball and and, yeah. and, and softball and, and all, you know, this our, all of our spring sports, men's and women's lacrosse, tennis, right, and, and trying to compete for championships like we like we have in the past. But Well, we, yeah, we were looking forward. We were already involved with covering uh, baseball and a little bit of lacrosse this spring. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to spring football. And one of the things that's interesting, you just mentioned uh, the Superintendent General, Darrell Williams, uh, when he was uh, – serving and he served as a commander of the army in Africa uh, a number of years ago and he was involved with fighting the Ebola crisis there and when he was introduced at West Point General Milley said you know how many lives he had saved and I'm sure that experience uh, in Africa fighting Ebola was very valuable in this situation. But no, no doubt about it. I mean, he obviously uh, almost, you know, it's it, it almost uh, divine intervention, right, that we have a leader here at West Point that has that type of experience on his resume. Uh, and he's just been such a strong leader for us in, in helping keep us focused on the real threat of, of what a virus can do to, uh, you know, to a population, whether it's our student population or, as I said earlier, kind of the city of West Point 
where people live in addition to working, and then the workforce, obviously, that, that comes from off post onto post on a daily basis. And so there's no question that uh, the lessons that he learned um, in his experience in fighting Ebola have served us well here at West Point. And uh, Colonel, one of the things that really stood out is in your background, 31 years in the Army, is how you, uh, some of the places that you stopped and then that you were able to advance your education, the level of the PhD from MIT, Sloan School of Business, actually. Tell us, you would, a little bit about uh, your transition from West Point into the Army service and then going into the direction of academics. Yeah, sure. So I, you know, when I was an undergrad at West Point, I, I studied leadership or organizational behavior. Um, you know, I knew I was going out to, to be in the Army and was going to be expected to lead, and I thought that was a great preparation for it academically. Um, I, I left West Point I, uh, when I graduated and went to flight school um, and became a UH-60 or a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. And then my first assignment was in um, in Germany, uh, in Hanau, Germany. And I was there for three years, I had the the fortune of being able to take my platoon to Somalia during Operation Restore Hope. Um, and so I spent a little bit of time in Africa uh, as a young lieutenant, um, but it was a great opportunity for me to take my team and all the things that you work for in preparing your, your platoon in this case um, to be prepared to do their job and have the ability to actually go and execute it in a real life situation. Um, when I came back from Germany after serving there for three years, I, was, uh, I went to Fort Bragg to the 82nd Airborne Division and spent three years there where I, I jumped out of airplanes uh, probably more times than I flew a helicopter while I was there. But wow. I was able to command a, a 235-person company, um, serve as a, an operations officer for a while, and, and also as a brigade uh, personnel officer. Um, and it was during that time, really, I was trying to you know, decide what I wanted to do next um, in life. And, you know, there are a couple options in the Army. Certainly, when you come out of company command, they're looking to send you to a what we call a broadening assignment. So it might be with, you know, it, it could be with ROTC or to one of the training centers, um, potentially working in um, somewhere in the Pentagon. Um, and I was also thinking about uh, life outside the Army, what I might do. And But one of the things from my time as a cadet at West Point, I, you know, I played on the what's now called the sprint football team. Back then it was 150 pound football. And uh, while I was a player on that team, you know, we had a couple of the coaches were civilians um, that worked in different capacities on West Point. But the, most of the coaches back then were members of the faculty. So they might be teaching calculus, uh, you know, during the day and then, and then coaching football in the afternoon and evening. And uh, th those, those uh, folks, those Army folks who were our coaches um, were my mentors, right? They were the ones who helped shape my vision for what I wanted to be as, a, as an officer in the Army and uh, certainly influential in my decision to join the aviation branch. So as I was thinking about what I wanted to do after company command, I, I, I had thought back to my time as a cadet, and I thought what a great opportunity it would be to have the, the chance to go back to teach at West Point, and as importantly, to, to be able to work with student athletes, um, potentially as a coach for the 150 pound or now the sprint football team. And so I was very fortunate. Uh, to have the opportunity to do that. I, you know, I worked with, uh, um, maintained a good relationship with the head coach of the sprint football team, the head officer representative, uh, Colonel Kays, now Brigadier General Retired Kays, who was the head of the Department of Systems Engineering and served as the head officer representative for the sprint football team. And so I'd reached out to him just about the possibility of coming back um, and really to get some professional guidance or mentorship on, on that process. And he offered me an opportunity to come back to his department in systems engineering. And so that really launched me into the opportunity to go to the University of Virginia. I spent uh, about a year and a half there where I picked up my master's degree in systems engineering, um, which is a, you know, it's certainly a departure from studying organizational behavior at West Point. But, you know, as you're, as you're probably aware, West Point has a pretty broad-based core curriculum that includes a lot of math, science, and engineering. And thankfully, I had enough of that in my background um, that uh, the University of Virginia was willing to accept that, accept me into their systems engineering program. So then came back to West Point and, and, and really was fortunate to be able to do exactly what I wanted. I, I loved teaching cadets, but I loved as much my time that I was able to spend with cadets outside the classroom, getting to know them uh, you know, in, in the things that they did outside the classroom. And for me, I had the opportunity to, to spend about two and a half years coaching the sprint football team. Um, and, and that's really, you know, to me, that was 
so fulfilling, right? To be able to make those connections with student athletes, helping them to balance their responsibilities in the classroom and, and on the football field. Um, and that really sparked, you know, for me that, you know, I, I think then I knew that you know, working in college athletics was going to be my eventual uh, second career, if you will, um, after I finished my time in the Army. But I was fortunate uh, come, leaving West Point to have the opportunity to go to MIT, as you mentioned, um, and study in their uh, School of Management there up at MIT, and then return to the faculty as an academy professor, which essentially meant that I was going to be at West Point until uh, until my retirement. And so I rejoined the, the, the Department of Systems Engineering and, and continued to teach. Unfortunately, my response my, my day job didn't allow me to continue to coach, but I did uh, end up becoming the head officer representative for the sprint football team. So I did have that outlet where I was still able to work with the, the student athletes, the cadet athletes on the sprint football team, but more in a developmental kind of role, more worried about their performance off the field and, and not so much worried about their performance on the field like I, I focused on as a coach. Um, yeah, and, and while I was on the faculty, you know, uh, had the opportunity to, to spend time in Afghanistan with the 82nd Airborne Division to, to work with their division leadership. Uh, I did a deployment, another deployment to Iraq, um, where I worked with the U.S. forces in Iraq doing strategic assessment stuff. So, so using my systems engineering skills there and then my last deployment to uh, Djibouti. So back to the African continent, I guess, in, in 2014, which was my last deployment. Um, to spend time there with the Joint Task Force headquarters that's based out of uh, Djibouti. And, uh, I always got to say, the Marines told us Djibouti was one of the toughest places you could get assigned to. So that's not a small thing to go there. Plus, I mean, that's, you know, you're an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran. Uh, that's, a, that's extraordinary, too. Yeah. So, and then, uh, you know, as I was starting to wind down my, my, my military career, getting, starting to approach my, uh, my retirement date or my mandatory retirement date, uh, you know, I had done a couple of projects with the athletic department. I was working as the head officer representative, as I mentioned, but then uh, our, our previous athletic director, Boo Corrigan and General Caslin, our previous superintendent, um, had gotten, gotten me and one of my colleagues involved in a couple of projects in support of the Army football team and then more broadly the athletic department. Um, and so I had a chance to kind of experience the, you know, what it was like running or being as a part of the athletic department from uh, an insider perspective. And uh, that just that just confirmed to me that I wanted to try to continue to work in athletics, continue to continue to work with student athletes um, when I retired from the Army. And thankfully, uh, Mr. Corrigan was very helpful in, in that transition for me. And then ultimately, Jeff, uh, you know, Coach Jeff Munkin, our head football coach, offered me the opportunity to 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 work as his director of football operations. So I retired from the Army, uh, you know, in May of 2017 and, and started working on June 1st for Coach Monk and, and spent a great year with the football team, um, really getting into the nuts and bolts of how, how Division I athletics works and in particular Division I football works, um, really with a, from a hands-on perspective, which gave me exposure to the rest of the athletic department. Um, you know, we were fortunate. We had a great year that year. We uh, you know, we beat uh, Navy and Air Force, won the Commander in Chief's Trophy for the first time in 21 years. Um, I, we were 10 and 3. We won our bowl game and, you know, had a chance to go to the White House with the team. Um, and really taking the team to the White House was one of the last things I did as the Director of Football Operations um, before Boo Corrigan offered me an opportunity to join his senior staff in the athletic department. And so I transitioned to his staff in uh, the summer of 2018. And I've, I've been here ever since working now with Mr. Mike Buddy, our new athletic director, who's just come on and been a, a tremendous sort of boost of energy for us in the athletic department. Hey, I got—I just want to go back to systems engineering sure. for a moment. Uh, uh, many of the uh, the football players and athletes at West Point uh, uh, tend to go and take that particular major, and uh, it's you know part of something we've been studying uh, the importance of STEM education, mm -hmm. you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, and. Uh, when you tell us a little bit about the major, if you would, and how it fits into engineering and the the value of STEM education to the overall military. Yeah, I, I guess I'll start where you ended, right? So the value of STEM in the military. Obviously, our military is becoming uh, increasingly complex, and the equipment that our soldiers are being asked to use and and, and to employ on the battlefield are becoming more complex. And I think having a STEM background or a STEM education, I think just really. 
I, uh, I think it empowers and it gives our leaders a, a, a level of comfort with being able to um, lead an organization that's employing that complex equipment, right? And I'll, I'll speak more specifically about systems engineering because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time while I was on the faculty trying to explain what it was to, um, to cadets. Um, unlike a lot of other schools, cadets don't come to West Point with a having to pre-select their major. They come here and and sometime usually between their first and second year they're they're selecting what their major is going to be and and most folks have no idea what systems engineering is. I certainly didn't have a, a, an idea of what it was until I showed up at the University of Virginia to study it and uh, so um, so we we spent a lot of time talking to cadets about what what the discipline is and and why we thought it would be useful for them and so I'll just give you my perspective and and, and something I heard very early on in my time at the University of Virginia is that you know, systems engineering is good problem solving, right? And uh, I think what we try to teach in systems engineering, you know, in traditional engineering disciplines like civil and mechanical or aerospace engineering, very discipline focused um, and uh, very valuable skills that they learn there, but they apply it within their discipline. Systems engineering takes a more broad approach to, um, to the engineering discipline and says, you know, our, our world is made up of systems that are comprised of various components that are working together to achieve some kind of an outcome. Um, and in order to solve that complexity, to understand the complexity of system level behavior, you need to be able to kind of aggregate the various components and see how they interact with one another. And so a lot of what systems engineers are asked to do, so I start with problem solving, right? Generally systems engineers are interacting with the customer to understand what their true problem or challenge is and then they put together the team of professionals that are needed to solve that particular challenge. So if the challenge, you know, the, the, the solution set may call for a, a mechanical or a, a civil engineer or an aerospace engineer or an economist or a financial management expert, you, the system engineer is gonna bring that team together and it's gonna move that team towards solving the problem. And so oftentimes it's trying to build that team to integrate the work that's being done between different members and get them to come together and where there are conflicts or challenges, the systems engineer is the one that has to try to be able to resolve those. And so what a great uh, preparation for being an officer out in the army where you're gonna be faced with complex challenges. There's no approved solution necessarily. Um, and the solution to that problem may be some combination of tools or techniques from various disciplines. And you may have to pull people together and get them to work towards a common solution or a common goal. And, and so I think the skills that you learn as a system engineer translate very well into the roles and responsibilities of a leader in the Army. And then I would suggest a leader in life outside of the Army. And I, I often talk to our guys and gals when, uh, you know, when they leave the Army, you know, why are they so valuable or why, why do companies want to look for an officer to hire into their company? And one, it's because um, you know, they're, you know, obviously they, they're trustworthy, they're committed to excellence, they've led, they've had these great experiences where they've had to solve tough problems um, and, and often put into complex and situations where they'll have to learn on the fly. They'll have to learn this particular discipline or the particular problem area. And so as a systems engineer, you'll have the academic background to make you more successful as an army officer in solving those complex problems. And it's exactly what, um, companies are going to want to try to hire you for when you leave the army to, to, to be able to give their toughest challenges to you and expect that you're going to go off and find a great solution and do it with integrity uh, and you're going to come back with, with like I said with a solution that works right and so um, yeah so I, I was blessed to, to study it I was blessed to teach it um, and blessed to implement it in my life as I've, I've, I've as I've faced different challenges whether it was being in Afghanistan with the 82nd Airborne Division or being in, in Iraq or in Djibouti or even into my role as the, Depart uh, as the Director of Football Operations or now as the, as the Deputy Athletic Director here in Army West Point Athletics. Well, that's, that's a terrific summary. I, just, uh, I have an MBA background. I'm just curious, do you see um, systems engineering as sort of a bridge between business education, business process, and, and engineering? Yes, certainly. And, and in, in our Department of System Engineering at West Point, um, we often, I mean, we, our faculty will have, uh, when we send them off to graduate school to prepare them to teach, um, you know, there's a, there's a, 
there's a group of, of folks we're going to send off to get an MBA because we feel that that's a vital component to the systems engineering discipline, as well as sending folks like myself to a, a systems engineering pure uh, graduate program or an operations research uh, graduate program. So I think there are a, a number of different an engineering management as a separate field that we might uh, incorporate into that. So. Um, it, it, so to me, the, I think that the, the value in the systems engineer is they very often are the interface between the, the client or the problem and then the team that solves it. And so they're the forward facing, they've got to be able to take the complexity of the real world the, and listen to the client and translate that world into, um, in a way that then allows the discipline specific engineers or experts within the team to address the problem, right? They're that interface and they're the ones who, who, who uh, I guess, translate the problem on the way in and then translate the solution on the way out. And certainly a large part of any solution is gonna be the value in the solution, how well it addresses the problem, and then the financial aspects, what's the cost of implementing the solution. And oftentimes, you know, from a business perspective, you have to make the business case that, the, that, that what we're going to spend in implementing this solution is going to realize the return or the gains that we want and make it and make a strong business case um, when making a recommendation to a, to a client on the solution to their problem set. Very good. Now we're talking with Dan McCarthy, PhD, Colonel, 31 year veteran of the United States Army, Deputy Director of Athletics at the United States Military Academy. And uh, uh, Dan, if you would tell us a little bit about your role as Deputy Athletic Director working uh, uh, for uh, the athletic director, Mike Buddy, and working with the coaches, the staff, and the cadets. Yeah, so it's funny. So, I, you know, I, I said earlier, we were just talked about making the business case. A lot of, you know, our job in the athletic department headquarters is to, is to try to be that interface, right? It's to, you know, as we're looking at making investments in our athletic programs, our teams, um, you, you know, we've got this cost versus value, this, this revenue problem like anyone else, right? We've got to be able to pay our bills. Um, but we want to make sure that we're investing what we, you know, our, our, our money wisely, right? And so, um, so one of the particular roles that I, that I'm responsible for is our capital projects or capital improvements. And so, um, you know, we're getting ready to, to open um, the Anderson Athletic Center, which is a building we've been renovating now for uh, about two years. Um, and it's going to house our softball team and our volleyball team and our sprint football team, as well as a, a strength and conditioning and nutrition center that will service a lot of our teams. Um, it's almost a second Kimsey Center that you're very familiar with, yeah. where the football team resides and where we have the, our, that great strength and conditioning and nutrition center that services a bunch of our teams as well. Um, and, and so, in, in that respect, you know, my my role is to manage some of those projects, and and as we think about future projects that, you know, when we want to invest in our programs to upgrade facilities and things like that, I, you know, I've got to try to make the business case to the athletic director and to, you know, uh, that, that, that this is a project that we want to invest in. Another area where I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I try to help uh, uh, Mike Buddy, our athletic director, is really in, in support of the, the governance structure here at West Point. Um, as we have to represent um, the athletic department and the student athletes and to be a good partner within the the, the academy uh, system. And so, you know, that, that involves, you know, unfortunately the Army, lots of meetings, right, that we're trying to represent our interest in and, and to make sure that we're doing the best things, um, not just for our cadets, but in our case, particularly cadet athletes. And so as we make decisions here at West Point, um, you know, trying to be, to be able to represent those decisions. Um, and Mike is a, is a extremely quick study. I mean, he, he's is, is all in on West Point as, as anybody in just a short time that he's been here. Um, but, but a large part of my role has been to try to help uh, him as he assimilates into West Point. Um, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a, a strong background in West Point as a, as a former cadet athlete, as a, as a coach at one point, as a faculty member, um, you know, and so um, being able to help accelerate his learning. You know, when you first come to a place like West Point, we use de very different language than at a traditional university. Um, and so that's been uh, an area that I've focused on, not just with our athletic director, but some of the other senior staff that we've brought in to try to help um, their learning curve, if you accelerate their learning curve to understand the unique things about West Point. Um, yeah, but, um, but then also, you know, as we tackle challenges 
for the department and we try to set the strategic vision, the strategic direction for the department being involved in those conversations um, to try to figure out how do we do it in a West Point way, if you will. Um, yeah, and then uh, just maintaining the relationship between um, the athletic department and the government because our athletic department is is now uh, operates as a non-federal entity or a, a, a non-profit sort of separate private organization that operates on West Point. And so there are some just, you know, I won't say challenges isn't the right word. It's just the relationship between us as a private entity interacting with the government. Um, and, and so I manage that relationship. Um, and then I work with the men's uh, basketball team as well as our football team. And so, Again, that's sort of my outlet, like being able to spend time with those teams, with the with the coaching staffs on those teams and with our student athletes on those teams um, to make sure that those two teams in particular are, um, you know, are resourced the way that they need to be in order to be successful. Um, that as there, there, if there are obstacles um, that are identified by our players, by our coaches, by our support staff. I oversee the equipment staff for the entire athletic department, just trying to knock down those obstacles to facilitate success, right? Success on the court, success on the football field, success off, off the court or the field in their lives as cadets um, in that cadet athlete equation. So, um, yeah, and it's great. I, I love being around and working with the, with our coaching staffs, our support staff, and, and most probably uh, importantly, our cadet athletes. And so that, that, that role as the sport administrator for football and men's basketball allows me to do that. Well, I wanted to ask you about the time you served as interim at athletic director after Boo Corrigan left to go to North Carolina State last year. And uh, several of the teams did very well. And you had a very big day in Washington on the podium at the White House. Tell us about your experience uh, uh, there in last year. Yeah, so um, it was, look, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, a great time to serve as the interim athletic director. Our spring sports were finishing up and we were fortunate enough to win several championships um, uh, last spring between our baseball team, our men's lacrosse team, our women's tennis team. Um, uh, yeah. And our, our, our golf team. And, and so it was a great time to be the interim athletic director, but one of the highlights certainly was getting to go to the white house um, to be presented with the commander in chief's trophy that we had won the previous fall um, in 2018 for the second time, the only time we'd won it back to back in the history of the CIC trophy. So the previous year, the previous May, I, I was at the White House as the director of football operations. And, and while it was certainly a great experience, I was, I was pretty busy just kind of managing to the details of the trip. But, this, but last year, while I was serving as the interim athletic director, it was a, it was a completely different experience. I was able to, to enjoy the, uh, you know, to, to be able to spend time in the Oval Office uh, with several members of the football team, with our with our head coach and with our uh, superintendent and sergeant major, uh, to meet the president, to be able to tour the White House, um, it was it was really a pretty surreal experience. And uh, you know, you might remember Ken. That was the you know the super, uh, the president during his his talk in the in the Rose Garden. There first made mention of the fact that uh, he was going to look for a way to allow academy graduates to pursue professional sports careers. And uh, that was really the you know, the genesis of that um, that discussion happened in the Oval Office, and and so um, now here we are uh, a year later, and and we see the likes of Elijah Riley and Connor Slomka and Cole Christensen um, being able to sign free agent contracts with the NFL, and and uh, Zach McGraw with uh, Major League Soccer, Dom Franco in in the NHL, and. Jacob Herdebees looking hopefully forward to him getting drafted here for baseball. And, and so the opportunities, you know, that what we talked about a year ago, you know, starting to come to fruition for some of our, our cadet athletes to be able to pursue a professional sports career um, while deferring their service. Ultimately, they'll serve their, their, um, uh, their time as commissioned officers in the Army when their professional careers are done. I just think it, you know, we found a way, you know, really to get the best of both worlds to allow these kids to pursue their passion for athletics um, while still reserving the, the service that they're all committed to, to serve the Army, to serve our country as officers uh, in the Army um, when that time comes for them. And all be great representatives of the Army as they're having the chance to uh, uh, play professional sports. Now, just uh, wanted to get into talking a little bit about how you've been helping the cadets who uh, spent the last two months studying, working out at home, and what your thoughts are going into uh, starting to look at the fall. Um, 
lot of talk in the uh, in the national press. Oklahoma is very anxious to uh, uh, be able to come in and play at Mikey Stadium in the fall. And we saw Ohio State's talking about playing with a reduced capacity to uh, be in compliance on social distancing. Uh, what what's uh, what do you what are your thoughts on uh, on what on uh, planning for the fall at this point? Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously it was, uh, you know, uh, we were doing our very best to try to support our, our cadet athletes, our student athletes during this weird time while they've been away remotely. Thankfully, the NCAA gave us some flexibility there in terms of being able to communicate with our kids. So a lot of Zoom meetings and those kinds of things going on. Um, a little difficult to do workouts um, because kids had every different, you know, had, you know, they were, they had access to a, a wide variety, some with you know, may have had home gyms, others, you know, might have had very little to work out. And so we've tried to do some things to provide them with some uh, tailored workouts and things that based on the equipment they had available to them. And, uh, and then obviously, we're, we're continuing to monitor their academics and those kinds of things to provide them support as they need it there. I think as we look forward to well, so, you know, uh, we're looking forward here immediately to our, um, our senior class coming back to, to West Point to to participate in a graduation ceremony. I think a lot of us are excited to just to be able to have some students back on campus, although, you know, our ability to interact with them will be pretty limited given the very, uh, the strong health protocols that we've put in place to make sure that we're maintaining the safety of, of those kids, health and safety of those kids, as well as for the staff and faculty here. But it'll be nice to have that little bit of inject of, of, of life at, here at the academy by having our seniors come back for a brief period of time. As we look forward to the fall, I think, you know, we're all, like most schools, we're still in a, a little bit of a wait and see approach. I think, you know, we're starting to see positive signs coming out of the NCAA, out of um, our professional sports leagues, out of some of the conferences and individual schools who are um, sort of making announcements of, of plans or planning factors that uh, um, to try to resume um, athletics um, on some level and, and and what form that's going to look like is is we're still a long way off I think from knowing what that will be but I think right we're I think everybody is committed to trying to get back to a, a place where we can um, have our student athletes competing um, and obviously first and foremost making sure that we're doing that with their health and safety in mind um, and then as we talk about allowing fans or others to participate um, how, how are we able to do that safely? And so, as you mentioned, I think some schools have talked about maybe um, allowing fans into their venues in some, you know, at some reduced capacity that would um, facilitate social distancing or, or being able to do screening and those kinds of things to try to ensure the health of the, of the population that's coming into a, an arena or to a stadium or, um, you know, you know we're, and we're doing all those same kinds of planning exercises to, to take a look at you know, what, what uh, procedures we would put in place, what would be the cost of those procedures. Um, you know, and then you, as we talked earlier about, you know, making the business case, we have to weigh the cost of putting in procedures to allow uh, fans or to, to put our athletes back on um, the courts. And, and does that make sense even just from a business case? Um, but at the end of the day, I think we all want to play sports and we want to allow as many fans as we can to participate, whether that's in person or, or on TV or in another way. Um, but making sure that we're doing that in a, in a, in a safe way uh, and, and taking the appropriate precautions to do it. So. I just wanted to ask you about uh, the Oklahoma game on September 26. Obviously, everybody's been looking forward to it. It's a big story out in Oklahoma. They were writing about it in the papers there. Is there any update? Is that is that game still scheduled as, so, as <laughs> So our, all of our football games for this fall are still scheduled as, as we originally planned, um, but uh, they're, they're scheduled. That doesn't mean that we're going to play those games, right? Obviously, the situation is going to develop, and we, we may have to make alterations to our schedule, as, as may Oklahoma have to make alterations to theirs based on how things unfold. Um, I think everybody here is, is, is excited to have Oklahoma come here. Um, we were out there two years ago. I was I was with the football team there um, when we took them to overtime, and you know they, they uh, you know the the Oklahoma uh, fans, the Oklahoma administration there in the athletic department, they, they could not have been better hosts, more gracious hosts to us. Um, and uh, and as we were out there, you know, and they were excited about us being there in their stadium, they were just as excited about coming out here to play at West Point and looking forward to it even back then. And so I think that's part of what you're uh, hearing out of there now is that, look, they, they were really looking forward to this game. We're looking forward to, to being able to host them 
And so uh, I know that they're committed to, and we're committed to doing our very best to, to be able to keep that game on our schedule. Um, but we're, but we're going to have to just kind of see how things progress and see if we're, we're both going to be able to make that happen. Yeah, we really had a we're really well treated when we went out to Oklahoma. I had the chance to go to Fort Sill, where my father commissioned in 1942, and we we're just uh, tremendous hospitality by everybody at the athletic department at Oklahoma that day. Now, it's uh, just maybe a final thought for you. It's Memorial Day weekend. It seems different because a lot of the parades and events are curtailed. Are there veterans who stand out in your mind who, who uh, in your career of service in the Army, there's so many uh, veterans from West Point. Uh, uh, sadly, a number have died in service since 9-11. Uh, I also think of Chase Fresnicki, who's the a defensive back and a quarterback for Army, he lost on his first mission that he volunteered for when he went overseas. Are there veterans uh, that stand out in your mind? Yeah, so I mean, I guess my first instinct, like you mentioned Chase Presnicki, and so my involvement with the football team, obviously, um, you know, we uh, award, we present an award each year in honor of Chase Presnicki, and it's to me, it's one of the highlights of of the night because you really do um, impress upon the, the the young men on the football team in the pre presenting of that award um, that they're committing to something much bigger than themselves. I think they all. Uh, they all have a sense of it um, when they're being recruited to West Point and when they make the decision to come to West Point, when they when they commit themselves to being an Army football player. Uh, but but they they also know that they're committing to something that's bigger than that, to service as an Army officer. And when um, and when you see somebody uh, when you when you hear the story of a Chase Prasnicki, I think it, it it really hits home for the young men on our football team that they really are committing to something much bigger than just. To, to, to West Point or to, to being an Army football player or to being an officer. They're committing potentially their life to serving something bigger than themselves, to, to an idea, to our Constitution, to our Army, to our country. Um, and so uh, I think of, uh, of somebody like him who just was such a talented, uh, t t talented player on the field. What a great teammate by all accounts from people who speak of him. Um, and then going on to uh, serve our country and then ultimately paying the, that, the ultimate sacrifice there. And I think now, that's really what Memorial Day is all about, and whether we're able to do that um, as we have traditionally or not, I think the the message doesn't change that we need to be thankful that there are young men and women who are willing to serve our country in such a in such an impactful and direct way, and that who are ultimately willing to put their life on the line if need be um, in service to their country. Well, it, it's uh, something we always feel and, and remember and recognize when we visit West Point. Uh, uh, the history and those who have served, those who've died in service of the country from West Point and, and in the U.S. military. Just want to thank you, Colonel Dan McCarthy, Ph.D., Deputy Director of Athletics at the United States Military Academy, 31-year uh, veteran of the U.S. Army. Thank you for your service. Great to talk with you today. And uh, really, that's on behalf of everybody at the American Legion. Great to chat with you today. Well, thanks. Thanks, Ken. And I'm looking forward to seeing you out on a, out at the practice field when we're out there with the Army football team at some point in the future. Uh, we're certainly looking forward to that. We enjoy that. And we enjoy telling the story of West Point and uh, Coach Munkin's interviews and, and talking with the uh, cadets. So again, uh, thank you to Colonel Dan McCarthy, PhD, Deputy Director of Athletics at West Point. And this is Ken Kratzer on behalf of Sons of the American Legion radio based at Squadron. 135 in White Plains, New York, and our 350,000 members across the country, all part of the American Legion family, and the two million veterans who are members of the world's largest veterans organization. So uh, thank you. And again, it's Ken Kratzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio. Have a good day and stay well.